Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everyone. My name is Claire, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm grateful to be sober and a proud member of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'd like to thank Carl and uh, who called me and asked me to come and share my experience, strength, and hope with you, which is always a privilege to do that. And he also picked me up at the airport, and uh, it's always an experience. When I step off it, I call the big birds and, and to, to be a, a part of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, no matter where it is. I'd like to welcome the newcomers um, to this fellowship. I, I, was, I was looking at the newcomers' stand. It's always a privilege for me to participate for them. And congratulations to the chip takers and the birthday people. And I might as well give you my, I was uh, my, and the alcoholic came to Alcoholics Anonymous April, April the 9th, 1974. Um, in April, in a few weeks, it's uh, <laughs> continuous sobriety. I'll be 34 years sober, and thank you, God, for that in this fellowship. Uh, you know, we tell our story in a general way what it used to be like, and uh, one of the days was one of those perfect days when I, as I said, I arrived uh, yesterday, and I came early because I sponsored Kiever and you know, Billy for for a lot of years, starting out in Los Angeles. And this was a perfect day to, to be in your lovely city and the state. I've been here before through the years. And I, you know, I looked around and, you know, I, it was, it was, it was that feeling again, my God, for the grace of God and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I would have missed this. And, you know, I might as well tell you how old I am so you won't start counting on your fingers <laughs> because, uh, uh, I talk about times when a lot of you were well, certainly not here. Um, January, last uh, few weeks, two to four weeks ago, January 17th, I was 83 years old. <laughs> and the best is yet to come. <laughs> Uh, as I said, we tell our story in a general way, and, and uh, I don't want to. I was born in, in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, in 1925, and I'm not going to spend much time in Georgia tonight. You know, I, I, I remember sitting on a segregated train out of Georgia, and given uh, Georgia the, you know, and um, <laughs> uh, but you know, I tell you a little about my family, and I came from a wonderful family. My my father was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian of the Cherokee Nation and was born and raised on a, a reservation in North Carolina. And uh, my mom and he left that reservation and went into Alabama and then into Georgia, married my mom. And there were seven of us, and I'm the youngest of the seven. And I was born in Atlanta, and they were all born in a little town called Cherokee, Georgia. And I remember growing up in that city, and we talk about feelings a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I never quite felt that I fit in, and I grew up at a time in this country, in the culture, where, you know, I, I, I re really realized that there was a lot of fear, as I, as I, but I never saw alcohol, never. I went to church a lot. I had a stepmother. My mother died when I was three months sober. I have seven children, so I grew up with a stepmother who was quite religious, and... Um, and I, all I remember is a lot about growing up then was the church being um, really uh, sheltered, and I was never exp expressed my, my father exp was able to express myself. My father was an artist and an entrepreneur, and, was, and, and uh, I just loved hanging around. I loved, I adored my dad. And uh, so I would, I, um, I, when I got into high school, I was terribly shy. I, went to, I graduated from Booker T. Washington High School, and I won an art scholarship to the Boston Museum School of Fine Arts. And I want to tell you something. The one thing I liked about that church was the music, and that's about it. I was full of, <laughs> I was full of fear, and they talked a lot about God, and I, I, you know, I was just one of those kids that just, just was inhibited, and I just, 
I, I just wasn't able to deal with any of that. And then, uh, it was in 1939, I remember we went out to, to the airport, which is now Hartford Airport. It's called Chandler Field in those days, and uh, it was a big thing. You know, I'm one of the ones that grew up with our refrigerators and all of that stuff, it was a, but it was a great time. And the one thing I talk, they hear, I hear them talking about a lot here, now in, um, uh, out, you know, it, they said it's about feelings and, and fear. And I just remember growing up feeling fearful. And we went out there, and it was when they announced over over a microphone that um, that the Japanese had attacked Pearl, attacked Pearl Harbor. And then I was getting ready to go off to school, and that's when I got on that segregated train out of Atlanta. I went to Boston, and that's where I went to school. And it was during the war, and it was just a, an incredible time. And as I said, I'd never heard, I'd never been to a movie, 19 years old, I'd never been to a movie, and I didn't know how to dress, and I was, you know, just felt out of place all the time. And uh, I started had getting some friends in that in that school, and I remember starting to go to the movies. I love watching people up on that screen in that dark room, and people talking to each other, and relation, relationships or whatever that was, they call it, and so... Uh, but I, I also started hearing the music, and I, uh, I could listen to records for the first time. And uh, I was walking down the street one night with um, with another student, and these people walked out of this this club, a jazz club, and it was uh, the streets were full of, of uh, servicemen and uniforms, and it was rather exciting. And I, 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 when they walked out, I said to my friend, "Why don't we just go in there and see what they're doing?" And it was a jazz club, and that's where all of this stuff started. And uh, <laughs> and um, and I shall never forget it. We walk in there, and it was dimly lit, and the aroma of the cigarettes and the booze. And uh, down at the end of that bar was a rather portly lady, and she's singing the blues. And I remember my heart just started pounding. And uh, there was a little group of musicians, and they were playing, and the bartender leaned over, and he said, what are you going to have to drink? I had never heard of alcohol. Didn't know it existed in this, on this earth. And, but I remember in the movies, they talked about martinis. <laughs> and I was about to commit my first hip slick cool act, because I leaned on that bar and looked up and down, which became a big habit later, but you know. And <laughs> <laughs> and um, I said to him, we'll have a martini, honey. <laughs> I said, and make it dry. <laughs> I had no idea what a dry martini was. <laughs> he puts these two lovely stem glasses up there, and he ate, he, he, he ate this can. I now know it was a blender. And, and this noise, and he evened it out, and I looked at it, but it looked like lemonade. You know, and when I grew up, we had lemonade in the hot summertime, man, always. But I didn't know you were supposed to sip drinks. So I just picked it up and I dumped it. Pig from the gate, you know. <laughs> but I remember the way it made me feel. There was a little dance floor out there, and these couples were dancing. I'd never had a date, and I was just terrified that that one martini just... You know, that was a feeling of magic. The glass was empty. I still had it in my hand. I, who never smiled, was now I had a permanent smile. I walked over to by the, stood by the side of that, side of that little dance floor, and these couples were dancing, and all those fantasies just kept roaring in there that I thought about, wouldn't dare talk about. That night I got myself some new friends. I had never had friends. But that's how I got myself some friends. Um, uh, the big book call, I, I, the big book, uh, I call them colorful, but the big book calls them loyal companions. <laughs> I hooked up with the pimps, the madams, and the bad boys, and I learned how to walk the walk and talk that talk. And for years, I was able to do that until the disease of Alcoholics Anonymous took me to my knees, you know, pleading for mercy. I couldn't live and I couldn't die. But it worked for me well. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, on page 21, where it talks about the real alcoholic. And, um, I, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about alcoholism, but I, and I just, you know, I just knew I was having a wonderful time. 
and it was going to last forever. I met a nice young man on the bar stool one night who was a Bostonian and, and from a wonderful, lovely family. And uh, I was still going to that school, but you know, I, I was every night I started hanging in those jazz clubs. And I mean, I tell you, it was a run for about 10 years after I got out of school. And then we got married. We, we got married and uh, started even having, we had a little son. Uh, but that became my lifestyle. Today, I know the difference between a lifestyle and a life. Because I began, I could walk into those clubs and stand under at that mic and straight up stand up mics in those days. I started hanging out with Billie Holiday, Duke Ellington, and 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 Louis Armstrong, and and I used to hang out with Dizzy, Sarah Vaughan, all of them in those. And that I mean, it was wonderful because it worked for me for a very long time. You know, in the in in the book, in, in more about alcoholism. It, decide, it, des, it describes the insane things we sometimes continue to do to keep from doing step one and two and three. And in that list of insanities, you know, uh, it, it talks about natural wines, you know. Well, I, uh, my natural wine ended up being ripples, so I just, <laughs> you know, at the end of that run, it was, it was ripple, and I wasn't drinking out of rock pits of glasses and riding in memos and hanging in those clubs every night. And, and, and you know, it, it was great while it lasted. Uh, but, you know, it starts to turn after a while. I, you know, I start giving up the, the you know, 5 o'clock drinking. And when the, when the cocktail proper people did start drinking at 5, you know, it started getting down to 4 and 3 and, you know, that little son, we'd had a little son, and now I'm too busy because I shove him off on his grandparents to raise. And his grandparents absolutely loved him. God rest their souls, because by this time, you know, I'm, I'm really, my life is consumed with what I'm doing, and it's all about me. And, I, and, and my, what I, what, what's, what's good for me in my life. I, um, would call, go down in those clubs at three o'clock in the afternoon. My husband, family owned a trucking company and and so we could hang out whenever we wanted to but you know the kids start to grow up and I have it was painful when I think about it today and through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and that inventory and the uh, eighth and ninth step you know it was, it was so instrumental to me and the family in the book it talks about the family after and so I ended uh, you know started uh, not going over there because that's too painful when he'd say to me, but mom, you promised me the last time you came that you were going to take me to the park. And I say, yeah, baby, but next time. You know, there's a paragraph that says, selfishness and self-centeredness that we think is the root of our troubles. And it goes on in that paragraph to say we're, 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 we're busy, we're busy people. And we, you know, and, 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 I, and I, I just got too busy. And whenever I get too busy nowadays, trust me, I know something is wrong and I better stop and take a look at where my program's going. Um, I started um, hanging out with the mob. We started, you know, because they owned all those clubs in those days. And uh, they had the, uh, they owned, uh, they were all next door to each other. And then on, on occasions we'd get in that limousine and time's going on. That son is growing up now. He's about 10 years old. And we went, we made one last run over to New York, uh, to this great jazz club with the opening up. It was called Birdland. And Billy Eckstein was going to be the opening star that night. And I remember we piled in the limos and we, you know, we drove over there and the next morning we came back. And it seems to me that the God I've come to believe in, uh, has always gotten my attention on Sunday mornings. And it was a great Sunday morning. We all arrived back in Boston like early, you know, like eight or nine o'clock. And people on going to church with their little kids. And I don't go visit my son anymore because, you see, I don't like that look when they look at you. That look at you that made me feel like, you know, that, that this is, something is wrong, but I don't know how to fix it. And so uh, I'm sitting in the back of the limousine. And I know about sitting in, in, in back of limousines, dying inside. And I looked out that window, and these young families with their kids were standing on the curb to go into this beautiful New England church. And it was like a voice said to me, Clara, um, something is wrong with your life. And I agreed. The problem was Boston. <laughs> See, you, you know, 
if I just get out of Boston, everything else is going to be all right. Husband came in off the road, and I said to him, why don't we go to move to L.A.? Because he had his aunt and uncle were, were in the show business, and they worked for MGM. And I said, start a new life. Let's pick up, my son's name was Brent. Let's pick up Brent, and we'll start all over. And I'm going gonna, gonna to be the... A wonderful mother, and I, I know what the ladies are. My Indian father used to always say, I want my girls to be ladies. I knew what ladies were, but I hadn't been quite in that category for a while now, and <laughs> so I'm going to make a change, you know, all about a change. And we put that kid in the back of that car, we went straight out Route 66, right in the L.A., and I went with good intentions. But you see, when I have good intentions and I take a drink, the drink takes me. Then I give it the power because I can't stop drinking. But I did put a case of Jack Daniels in the trunk, and um, <laughs> I graduated from Martinez to Jack Daniels and uh, bourbon drinker. So we ride into L.A., and it was all going to be different. But I'm an alcoholic. We found a place, the family did, and, and we found a place, and I called up on the first stool in all one of the famous jazz clubs then. And I was off and running. You know, we had two more kids, and by, you know, a circumstance, a sense of a few circumstances, I went, I didn't, I never got back to teaching art or anything. I just went into a little small business, and things were, you know, going well. And we talk about crossing that line. My, my sisters and brothers, which is my father's desire, they all been highly educated. They all lived on the East Coast in Boston and New York. And they moved to California, so I'm, but they're watching me now. They're watching that behavior. And I get really annoyed when people start watching me when I'm drinking too much. And, uh, but I never thought it was ever too much. It was just never enough. Just never could get quite enough. And um, I'm beginning to lose it all. Thank you, God, that you took away from me everything I wanted in order to give me what I needed. Because it came that time in my life when I needed to stop drinking and I need to uh, stop dying and I need to find a God of my understanding. And so it, so there it was. And, uh, I remember my sister was a nurse in one of the hospitals in Beverly Hills. And I went over there one, one day and, and when I was losing it all and now I'm in Black House. Just like the, the book describes, and I'm just, I just, you know, I'm out of control. And that had never been the case for me for, you know, for, for years. And I go over there, and she's sitting there because all I need is two more payments, you know, to save the house. And I told her all these things I needed. And she looked at me, people who love us, look at us with that look. And I could still remember feeling her pain. And she said, you know, it pains us to watch you live the way you live. And it's going to pain us even more to watch you die. Now, growing up in Atlanta, you know, death was, was one of the things that, I, that was most fearful. Now, I grew up in, in the Baptist church, and you know, in the big book, and we agnostics, and I want to tell you, I, that's all been resolved. But at that time, that's what I heard. And I realize now in many times that that was my perception of what I understood. But what I heard, thought I heard them say, you know, my stepmother used to tell me, you know, when you, you're not a good girl. You know, you're gonna die, you're gonna go to hell, you're gonna go to hell. And, and they used to tell me these terrible things and let's fear about dying. You know, I, you know, I want to just pause for a moment. When I got sober in LA, they used to have a lot of bumper stickers. And there was a bumper sticker I was riding behind as a newcomer. And it says, you know, good girls go to heaven and bad girls go everywhere. You know, I'd been one of the bad girls and I wasn't about to go to heaven. I didn't think so. So, um, so I, so I, um, I started, uh, you know, I just, just, it just, I started, what, I just couldn't keep up with, with whatever was going on around me. And when she said that I bolted out of that hospital, and I went and I stood in, in, in front of that house and watched the marshal put the lock on the door. That old son was then, uh, he'd, he'd been studying in the theater in, in, in the, the high school and, and getting awards at UCLA and for dramatic uh, performances. As, uh, he was like, 14, 15 years old when, when that all started, but now he's about 19, 20 years old. And we were, um, uh, he, he was in and out of my life and even then, and I should never forget, you know, was standing in front of the house. They're putting a lock on the door. 
and the two younger ones. My daughter was uh, by maybe eight or nine or ten years old at the time. My, my next son was about, uh, uh, I guess, 12, 13. And they're standing there looking at me, and it's all gone. The house is gone, the cars are gone, and that business is gone. I drank it all away, and employees, and I came in here on thousands of dollars on payroll taxes, and on and on and on, and I just couldn't stop drinking. Um, but I remember this older son, who was about 19, looked at me, and he said, you know, I don't know where you're going, but I'm not going with you, because you've never been there for us. And the arrogance that I stood there looking at their son crying silent tears. You know, I, I couldn't cry any more tears. And I only wanted to say, but if you, if you understood, you know, if, you, if I knew better, I'd be doing better. But my arrogance said, and screw you too. And I'm going to tell you I'm a double winner, thank God, because I'm a member of Al-Anon today. And the, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the family after, thank God for that, you know. Uh, for the wisdom of the ones who wrote the book. Uh, and he walked out of my life, and I'm standing there, and I had no place to go. And that family was a loving family, and, uh, and I couldn't go to them anymore. And, uh, and, and, and when they said they pray for me, I've come to believe in the power of prayer. I, I, I looked at the two young ones. I had one friend left. It's the, I always believe that God believes us an angel. In our life, there are no mistakes. I've heard that for years from the old timers in Alcoholics Anonymous. There are no mistakes. And God has worked, was always working in my life anonymously. He's always, there seemed to be someone there. And uh, he's an Israeli friend of mine, and they, they had watched me. Because by now, I'm ending up in blackouts and being beaten up in the streets. And I remember that husband came to me. We drank drink to drink. It ended up, I always thought he was, you know, he was the one drinking too much, but it was me, and I didn't know that. And I was, I guess you call that judgment. And so I was ending up in County General Hospital in L.A., and that is not one of your favorite HMOs, let me tell you. <laughs> With nervous interns from USC, you know, stitching you up and out of, you know, coming out of blackouts. And, uh, you know, you're the second half of the first step that my life was unmanageable. And the first half of that step tells me that I'm powerless over alcohol. See, I didn't know that, 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 that my unmanageability is because I couldn't stop drinking. And so it all ended up, and she has mailed me a little, and I put it away in an envelope and never opened it. And all I had was a bag and those two kids, because they gave me 60 days, and my life was just so, so unbelievably out of control. I couldn't get anything together and what I had on. And I called the cab, and I opened it up, and there was some money with an address on it. And I handed it to the cab driver, and he said to me, Lady, this is the ghetto, South Central Los Angeles. And my attitude was, whatever, whatever. And I get in that, and I get in that cab, and I look at those kids. And I want to tell you about that journey. It's... Um, I remember driving up there. I'd never lived like that. I'd never it knew that that part of our Los Angeles even existed. And we walk up those stairs, and I, I we walk into this little dirty hole of a wall, and little they call it a California cottage. And I drew the drapes, and I guess I was doomed to die of this disease. And I looked at the kids, and they're looking at me, and it was dirty, and it was furnished, and. Uh, and that was, that was the beginning of the end. For three years, I lived down there. And I used to come, um, you know, I, it got so bad that grandparents moved out and, and took the kids and bought a house, and they moved into the uh, Santa Monica, Venice area. And uh, there I am, you know, I'm gonna tell you, I, let me tell you my, what I got dressed and what my, what I wore for the journey. I, I bought myself a white cherry color robe, and I bought a bright red wig, it had bangs. <laughs> and by this time, I am a full-blown whinette. And, uh, and, um, and I used to get drunk and trim the bangs. <laughs> you should have seen me in front of the mirror. Drunk, you know. I had what you call zigzag bangs. <laughs> and... Um, 
then I would sit in, you know, in those days they had black and white television. It used to go off at midnight. The channels all went off at midnight. And I would sit in that chair, that overstuffed chair. And I would stare at that, and just driven with fear. Like I said, sick of living and couldn't die. And, but that my heart would start to pound. And I would get out of that chair and go to any of those sleazy, uh, joints that where I used to, you know, you know, I used to go to the Cotton Club and I used to go to Harlem and I used to hang out in, you know, in the, uh, the finest uh, clubs in those places and drink the best and do the best and look good, looking good almost killed me out there, you know, looking good. And now I'm, 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 I'm stumbling and by this time, you know, I have, my body is blown up, I got wine sores on me. And my mode of transportation around town was a pair of gold fuzzy house slippers. And I, uh, and I'd mosey on over to around midnight to the, to the bars because I had to hear the music. You see, I had to hear that empty laughter. You know, and all the geniuses sitting on the bar stools and solving the world's problems. And I just go in there and I used to complain about Queen Elizabeth. And you know, I mean, we, we just, you know, I used to tell, you know, know how she should run England. And I was really into it. And, uh, and then, you know, I'd go into those blackouts. And I'd end up sometimes at awful hour of the morning. The bars in LA closed at two o'clock. And at awful hour of the morning, I would, uh, come to in a feed position in front of that house in tall, wet grass. And the silence was deadly. And I could hear, you know, dogs travel in packs when you live in the ghetto. It's all about survival. And in those days, they had metal trash cans out on the sidewalk. And I would be down in that grass, you know, you know, crying and dying and, and then and it would take several of those dogs to push the can over. And I can still remember the lid rolling down the street. And I'd make a deal with a God. I didn't believe in God. If you just get me off the ground this morning. And I could, you know, my little daughter, you know, her image would come into me. And I'm down there. And she, and she used to say things to me. But, Mom, you always promised me you'd come in the PTA meeting. And I said, yeah, baby, I am. She said, but you always get drunk. And I cannot tell you how that used to just leave me distraught lying there. And then, and then I'd get up off of that ground and get up those steps and get down that hall in that dirty environment that I lived in, get to that bathroom, get on my knees and, and, my, and, and my chin rolling around in that cold porcelain and I'd pass out. And when I come to, I try to focus, there's two words that always greeted me, uh, uh, American standard, you know. And, <laughs> you know, you stare at that long enough, the words get straight, you know, and then I'd get on up, you know, and then that's when I would just, you know, just get up and it started all over again. That was day in and day out. You know, there comes a time when I, when I study the book, because Alcoholics Anonymous, the big book is a textbook. You know, it's not a novel. It's not something we put up on the shelf every once in a while, and on a rainy day we pull it out. You know, um, I see a lady here that um, was in Los Angeles and, and had uh, several, I guess, months. And I do, um, I do a uh, workshop for 20-some years uh, based on Joe and Charlie. Some of you know Joe and Charlie. I used to travel around the country with them, and I have the the, uh, the manuscript to their uh, big book study group, and I've done it for years. And, you know, and I, and I, in, in the book, it talks about, it talks about service. And, and you know, I never thought of any, you know, the self-centeredness that always um, was part of my lifestyle you know, I just never could get it together. So when I would uh, trying to get get up, get up off that floor, and I'd stumble on out and start another day. And um, I don't know what happened uh, one morning that was different, because my usual day started with me waddling down to the nearest liquor store, standing in front of the door, and waiting and waiting and waiting for the um, and for the that owner, the clerk, to come. Uh, it's it's called pitiful incomprehensible demoralization when I'd stand outside and wet myself, 
you know, and trying to act cool. My cool days had long been over, you know, and wait for him to go inside, and I'd stand at that counter and watch him count the change and and then and, and, and then then put the change away and lean on that and lean on that uh, counter and say to me things like, well, I said, what are you gonna drink today? Uh your usual? Uh what are you gonna have? Thunderbird or Ripple today? And I would get annoyed with him and he would put it on a paper bag and I, I would just snatch it out of his hand because he played with the top. And it was like, you know, you know, and just get out of his way and, and, and get past the plate glass window and back, get back to that house. And that's what it was like for a long time, for those three years. To me, that was a lifetime. And one morning, I don't know what was different. I had been out partying again. I never wanted to give up being a party girl. I did it so well, you know, and, and one more time, I just couldn't give it up. It was on, and it was on a, another Sunday morning. And um, they didn't have cell phones in those days, but I was getting uh, coming out of a lot of hospitals just for you know the treatment of being beaten up in the street. And I and it was on a Sunday morning, and they had the you know pay stations out on the sidewalk. And this is the last I remember uh, was a leg with a cowboy boot on it, and my head was against the curb. And he was kicking me in the head. And I know about pain. In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, so beautifully described the, the, the insanity of the disease is called the jaywalker. And I kept doing insane things over and over with my insane friends, always expecting the different results. But somehow, I, he was kicking in my ribs and I, passed out. And when I came to again, I was in a Catholic hospital, not far from the ghetto where I lived. And over me were paramedics pumping me back to life, the police there, this older nun with a black habit on, and she had her hands in the sleeve, horn rim glasses on, probably a woman about, probably in her 60s. And they were all trying to get pump me back to life. And the older nun leaned over me and she said, you talk to the police. You tell them who did this. And I, you know, I'd run around with the mob and, you know, I had an Indian father. You know, the father said, you never tell our secrets. And the mob, and the mob said, you better not. And, uh, and I, but I didn't know. She turned and she walked and she stood on the door and she looked back at me. In Alcoholics Anonymous, we call it sometimes a moment of clarity. Now, I've been out there drinking for 25 years on a daily basis, and when that nun, older nun, looked back at me, she shook her head, and then she walked out of the door. Everybody left, the paramedics, the police, everybody left. But the young nun stood there, in her early 20s, um, with a white habit on, I looked up at her. Her eyes were as blue as the heavens. The young nun had some gauze and a solution, and she started to wipe. The, I was bleeding out of the corner of my eyes. And she said to me, how did you ever let your life get into such a state? And I looked up at the, it never occurred to me not alcohol. That was my love of my friend. You know, I could I could depend on that because I could never trust another human being. And, and I just shook my head. And I don't know, um, three days later, they treated alcoholics. I suppose they do most. I do a lot of work in hospitals and jails uh, in Los Angeles for years now. But they hold them 75, uh, 73 hours, and then they release them out from the hospitals. And um, But they had banished me up with... Uh, gauze and, and two and a half inch wide adhesive tape. And the young nun that walked around me and pulled the ribs back together, which left me bent over. So three days later she came that out of 200 nuns, I call her my earth angel until this moment, out of 200 nuns she was chosen out of the group to, was to, to, to dress me. And I remember you, you should have seen her. I had on a my bad leather jacket, she had that over my shoulders because I couldn't lift my arms. And uh, you should have seen her trying to find out where the bangs went on that wig. 
she kept shifting it, you know. And then, and then she'd shake her head and she'd go back this way, you know. And it was a, you know, I didn't do any, and it was matted, you know, it was, she didn't know where the bang, what the bangs from the rest of it, you know. But I remember she walked me to that door, and she stood outside the door of the spiritual being that she is. And she put her arms around me and she t- quietly said, try not to drink today. But I'm an alcoholic. And I, she looked at me and she waved and I looked over my shoulder. I walked to the nearest liquor store. That's the insanity of the disease. And as the second step talks about the insanity returns, you know, as long as, you know, as I, I needed a drink, the insanity returns. That's what tells me to go get one. And it was three days, uh, three weeks later that I came through. I don't know what was different that morning than a lot of other mornings when I would get to the liquor store, come to with strangers and find, trying to find out where I was this time. But I, I, um, I came to in, on a dirty floor with the, I hope I never forget the stench of a dirty, dirty body and uh, I had lost the will to care. And I just got off of that floor and I stood in that room and I, I started to cry. And this is when I said, oh God, please, if you are there, please don't let me die. And that I believed, for me, I had never heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had no idea that there was any place that, that there was about recovery. All I know that was a simple prayer. And I have come to believe in the power of prayer. And, uh, and, and I'm standing there crying and, and I believe today for me it was a divine intervention. The Spirit of God must have kissed me gently and said, child, get off the floor. Because you don't ever have to live like an animal again. And I, um, stood up and I walked and I called my same friend who gave me the money to go, go to the, to go to the ghetto. And I said, Rachel, I think I'm going to die for don't stop drinking. That was my first moment of truth. And she said, you know, we've been, she's not an alcoholic. She said, we've been praying for you. She said, there's a place called Alcoholics Anonymous. And she said, uh, I don't know their number, but I hear they help each other stay sober. And little did she know, she's still my friend. Talked to her last week. We've been friends over 40 some years. And, um, and I went to the phone, and I picked up the phone, and I said, the operator answered, and I said, uh, is there a place called Alcoholics Anonymous? And she said, yes, dear. She said, uh, uh, it's called Central Office, and I'll put you right through to them. She probably, she, maybe she was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. How was she known, you know? <laughs> I always couldn't figure that one out, you know? So uh, she put me right through the central office, and the man said, good morning, this is Alcoholics Anonymous, Give me, can I, may I help you? And in my best street language, because I know all about the streets, and I want to say to the newcomer, you know, there's a song out, it's called uh, Street Life, and and I love the lyrics were really written for me. Um, it, the lyrics goes like something like, if you are young, don't get old in the streets. Because the cold is going to hit you in the back and you're going to nickel and dime your life away. You look back one day, it was all a masquerade. There's a thousand lives to play out there. Can you play your life away? And there, you know, and so when he said, do you think you can stay sober today? Nobody ever said today. They always told me how they could stop drinking. And I could never do that. I never even tried. And I said to him, I don't know that moment. I said, I think I can do that. I'll try. And he told me about the meetings, and he said, you go to meetings, they will greet you, and he told me where to go. Now, I told you my story. Here I am smelling like a bear who never had a bath in ever, you know, and I, not even in the rivers. And I, I'm bloated, I got wine sores, and I got fluid running down my cheeks. And I say to him, do you have meetings in Beverly Hills? <laughs> And he said to me, yes, we do, dear, but you go into the meeting in your neighborhood. I said, all right, all right, I can do that. <laughs> so I didn't know about detoxing or anything, so I started to get dressed that morning. And I hope I never have that experience again because I didn't know, you know, you know I start, around 10 o'clock I started jerking and scratching. My brother, I, God love him, bless his soul, 
worked with Delta Airlines uh, uh, at LAX, and I called him. He did the night shift. I get the phone. I said, Ike, I think I found a place for me. It's called Alcoholics Anonymous. And the, the man told me they're going to help me stop drinking. He said, oh, I said, but I need a car. My Cadillac was gone. The trucks were gone. And everything was gone. And I would have been scuffling around down there without any transportation except those who drove me around. And um, he said, I'll bring my car by, and I'll, and I'll leave the car up there for you. And he said, you keep it as long as you want to. So I started to get dressed for my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I go in the closet. First, I get the wig out. <laughs> and I put in, you know, ladies, you, know, you ladies know, they have a headphone. So I put her, I put that wig on that, on that, on that headphone. I got the brush out and I raked her up and put some really nice bangs across the front. <laughs> And I put some hairspray, and you know, she was looking wonderful sitting there, you know. <laughs> and uh, and then around around 11 o'clock, I'm really pulling, and 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 the car, my brother dropped off the car, and I go on what to wear. Now I got a red velvet dress, and this is April, and uh, I was 65 pounds overweight, and this and, the, and this, you know, I, the, the hips were kind of pushed out the seams, and. And I cleaned it up, all the wine stains off the front of it, and it hung in the closet. It looked really nice. Around 1 o'clock, I can't stand it. And I fought going to that liquor store, which was three doors from where I lived. But I went over to Woolworths, and I decided to browse and kill time. He said it was an 8 o'clock meeting, so at 7 o'clock, you know, I went. I was going to be ready by 7 o'clock. So I was browsing. So I, I was just going from counter to counter. So, uh, just to kill time, so as I said, and then I stole some eyelashes for, for my first meeting with Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and they come quite long. And I didn't know you were supposed to trim them down to size. <laughs> so at 7 o'clock, I'm standing in front of the mirror, and they come with a little tube of glue, and I am bouncing like a motor. And I'm getting the glue along the edge of the lash, and I remember, and I grabbed my elbow, and I waited for an opportune moment. <laughs> and then I slammed it in. <laughs> One end was up here, the other end was down there. I'm looking at myself in the mirror, I'm too tired to start all over. <laughs> so I lean in the mirror and I say, you are looking good. <laughs> And I went off to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and I should never forget that. And that was the last day uh, that, I, that I had ever... That, and I want to tell you what happened to me that morning on that floor. I believe that the compulsion uh, to drink was removed. I have never had the compulsion to drink again. The thought of drinking is the insanity of disease that will always be there, whatever the circumstances are. And I've never, and, but I believe what happened to me, I've thought about this many times through the years. Well, I talked a little earlier about, you know, growing up in, in Union Baptist Church, and one of the things that I always loved was when I sang in the junior choir was the music. And the music were always spirituals that the slaves in the fields of Georgia who couldn't read or write would put those lyrics together and they would sing the songs that used to touch my heart when I would sing it, because I always wanted to be in that world of, of, of music, and I just, it wasn't my talent. But, and I remember one of the songs that they used to sing, it was my favorite that happened to me that morning. The lyrics went something like, Soon one morning, death came knocking on the door. Oh my Lord, oh my Lord, what shall I do? And that was my, I believe, the God in my life that divine spirit that I call that lives within me, that I walk to that phone. And so he didn't tell me it was in the church. I, because when I sat on that segregated train out of Atlanta, I made two commitments. I would never put my foot in the church again, you know, and I never wanted anybody anybody in my life to tell me what to do. It was the arrogance and the, and the ism, I guess, I'd always had. So... um I, I, I just had those commitments. So when I, I, I he told me where, where the church, where, where it was, he didn't tell me it was a church. And I remember walking 
uh, up up the um, up the uh, up the drive up the, up the st- drive. It was a driveway, and then you went up the steps. It was the back of the church that we went into, and the greeter was there, and he said um, he said um, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I sat down, and we didn't have treatment centers in those days, and we all came right off the streets and. Uh, and out of the get out of the street people and and uh, and, and, that, and I I just I remember sitting on my hands and bouncing around and uh, the lady they started the meeting and the lady behind me touched me on my shoulders and and when they asked for the hands of the newcomers that's why I welcomed the newcomers because I didn't know I was a newcomer she said raise your hands honey you're a newcomer and I raised my hand. At the coffee, at the coffee to break, uh, they had real coffee cups in those days. And, uh, I went in, and I was shaking so bad. And they, you know, when I got sober, they didn't have detox. They didn't have any of that. The old comers would come, old timers would come to the meeting with a jar of honey and a spoon and a squash of lemon in it. And when we would go have, when we used to, um, Go into convulsions and meetings, they would just get the honey, put it in us, take the 12 and 12, put it between our teeth to keep us from swallowing our tongues. And that's what, that's what the meetings were like when I got sober 33 years ago. So, uh, and I, and when I was shaking so badly, I couldn't hold the cup. And this lady walked up behind me and said, uh, my name is Claire on a little piece of paper. She had written her number. She said, my name, my name is Carol. And I'm going to be your sponsor because we we only had 800 meetings in the whole city of Los Angeles then, and for us, 15 people at a meeting was a big meeting when I got sober. And we all hung together, and she said, "You go home and, and I'll tell you what Alcoholics Anonymous is all about." And uh, I went home, and my brother's car, my barred car from my brother, and she read the preamble to me over over the phone, and that was the beginning of this journey. And it's just been incredible. And I, you know, I got into the steps and, and she's a person of service. And, and if you're just beginning, this is a program of service. And, you know, the book talks about, you know, give, you know, passing it on and giving it back. And, and I got very involved right away. I was not a very happy newcomer. I, you know, like most newcomers, I did my, had my little mistakes. But, you know, I got into those steps and, um, and um, my son was now was uh, out in his career, and and my uh, t- my son, uh, next son and my daughter had grown up, and and it was it was it was the twelve step time, and I remember doing that inventory and how how important that was, you know. And I look back over that honest inventory that it talks about, and I did that, and I did all those things suggested, and and, and as I said in the in the family after, uh, things began to to get better for me, and when I was three years old, I went back into the business I had drank away, and I have my company now for 29-some years, and what I do is I have a company that's um, a service company to the rich and the famous, the movie stars, I manage their homes, and that's what I do, and the great athletes, the the athletes, the musicians, and and that's what I do, and I also have my, part of my company is I work for contractors that that build the gated uh, uh, I have uh, crews of people that clean the, the newly uh, contracted, built, ho- newly built homes. And, you know, things were getting better. And as, as you know, when things I got on with my life, my son, my, uh, that older son at the time had, had, uh, had gotten to be well known as an actor and performer and uh, was working in New York at ABC Television and he was doing well. And he never, he never, he kept his promise. He didn't, I didn't see him for four years into my sobriety. And I like to talk about this part in the family after because um, my sponsor, as I said, sent me to, to Al-Anon. And he had that occasion when we doing the, when we were making that, when I was making that amends to him and it, as a direct result of the fourth step. He came home to visit and uh, I sat him in that room and it was so painful. For me to take the responsibility of, of my, what part my life played in his life. And you know, I had to get honest and that was very hard for me, uh, to tell the truth. And I remember sitting in, and he was a handsome young man and he's sitting there looking at me and, and I said, you know, if, if I hadn't, as I said earlier, if I had known better, I'd have done better. 
but I, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous now, and I don't live that way anymore. And, and he looked at me and he said, Mom, he said, you know, that's today. He said, tomorrow is gone. We don't know about tomorrow, uh, about tomorrow. And, and let's just do it a day at a time. And he, he never was it, knew anything about a 12 step program. He was just a wonderful young man. And, uh, he went back to New York to work. Uh, my, that daughter that I couldn't go to her PTA meetings, um, I uh, grew up to her parents' tent, and I saw that daughter, the promises coming true. And I saw that daughter go into the ice capades as one of the first black professional ice skaters in the, with the Dorothy Hamill tour. And now, you know, I look back, and that's what al helped me with a lot, was to, 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 to bring that, our relationship. And I want to tell you, you know, I've done, it may take a long time, but it took me years to get the kind of relationship I, just actually four years ago, we, what we did, you know, I, we kept, we kept trying until my sponsor said, look, you let go and let God. And when, when things happen, it's when they're supposed to. And now we have a wonderful relationship. Uh, that next time, I watched him in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for the last, since he was 19, he started drinking and, and then, you know, he got sober and, and then he attempted suicide, and then, you know, an, another suicide two or three years later, and and uh, four and a half years ago, he attempted suicide the third time, and just in and out and in and out. And, you know, like we, the old timers used to say, we never shoot the wounded because the door swings both ways. We don't give up. We keep praying. We just be there as an example of this program that it works. And finally, he did uh, get sober four years ago, and now he's gone back to college, and he was 50 years old the day before yesterday, and uh, and he's on the dean's list, and, uh, and you know, you just don't give up, you keep coming back. Um, and now he's uh, working in uh, as a counselor on the weekends, he's getting a degree to be a counselor in one of the major, major uh, treatment uh, facilities there. But you know, one day I got the, a, a message in the 80s from that uh, son from New York that he was coming home. And uh, it was great. And then he uh, had gotten married, had a little son, I have a grandson, he's, I guess, 19 years old now, 20 years old. And um, he moved, then after the divorce, he moved to San Francisco, he was teaching theater arts, and he, what he did in, in, at that uh, television station was he worked with the major anchors, the six o'clock news, and Peter and Jennings and all of them. And he called me one day and he said, Mom, because when he was in New York, I don't know if any of you ever heard of Studio 54. And uh, he was, a, I was, mine was alcohol and celebrities and in the fast lane, you know, doing the dance. And his, he'd gotten into drugs in Studio 54 and sharing the needle and doing that. And in those days, we didn't know the danger of that, of cocaine. And he was in, in San Francisco, and he was doing um, teaching theater arts, and he called me, Mom. He said, you know, we become such good friends. You know, we become friends with our kids. And I, I mean, you know, I mean, that, that warm, loving kind of relationship. He said, you know, I, I'm having problems, Mom, because... Something's wrong. I went to the doctor the day, and they told me I have something called HIV. And in the 80s, that was a death group. There was no medication. And I was on the plane, and I left my people to take care of the company, and I flew to San Francisco. And I walked around that, that, that the city with my arms around him and his around me. He went to that doctor, and he said, we have no cure. We don't even know what this is. But... Um, I was there for him, but I never could take him to the park. Without this program, I never would have had that experience. I never would have been there. And uh, he said, Mom, I feel okay. Nineteen months later, uh, he called me. He said, Mom, I can't take care of myself. I can't work anymore, and I'm going to die. And I want to come home to die. And I had a place for him. And i got to tell you what that took. And, you know, I was sitting by his that bed for many, many days. And if you're new, I want to tell you, you never in your life have to do anything alone again. Because every, the members of Alcoholics Anonymous, a lot of the old timers, <clears throat> some of you have, have, don't, may not may have heard of Alabama Carruthers and some of the, the giant speakers around the country in those days, they were all there. My sponsor, <clears throat> and I have sponsorship, I mean, 
really, 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 I mean, sponsorship is the essence of this program, and they were all there, and you don't have to do it alone. My son had done a lot of work for you young ones who probably heard of um, uh, one of those rock groups, the Grateful Dead, I think they were called. See, I know Billie Holiday. I don't know anybody about Grateful Dead. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and he, one of them had written a, had some lyrics for us to sing. And when my, my son had gone down to 100 pounds, and they have cotton mouth, and we were... I would sit there day after day and just off of the straw drop water into his mouth to, to his parched lips. And he had written for us to sing these lyrics. All of the family were there, all of the loved ones. And it was 10.15 on a Saturday morning, the rasping sound of death. And that sun was suddenly quiet. And I pray to this soul of the wings of angels to a better place, no more dying and no more crying and no more pain. I fly a lot, not only doing this, but I travel a lot around the world just for vacations. And I look out the window and I'm a cloud person and I can see him sitting on that cloud with that handsome face and looking at me and we made our peace. You know, if you haven't done those steps, do it. You know, I mean, it's the freedom that we have. And I and I should never forget those moments, you know, and I stand here tonight. And I want to tell you the book, The Promises Come True, because my life has been rocketed into a fourth dimension. But by the grace of God, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, those 12 steps of recovery, the fellowship, and the love we find in these rooms has given me a life far beyond <clears throat> any uh, any dream that I could have had. See, I was a person who believed in fantasies. Now I get truth. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.